In 1792, a group of English abolitionists decided that the best way to show the world that the Atlantic slave trade was wrong was by creating a colony in Africa that would be run by the natives in the fashion of European plantations. Instead of triumph, they received yellow fever, cannibalism, death, destruction, and enslavement. The idea for the Bulama experiment was conceived in the wake of news of the Zong Massacre, an event where the captain of a ship threw 130 slaves overboard during an outbreak of disease on a voyage from Africa to the Caribbean on a common trade route of the time. The reasons for the deaths were not only to prevent further spread of infection, but also to claim insurance money on the cargo policy that the British Trading Company had taken out for the voyage. The policy dictated that insurance would not pay out if the slaves died onshore or of natural causes. The insurance could be claimed if some of the slaves were thrown overboard in order to save the others who were not yet infected. To make a long story short, there was a court battle between the company and the insurers over the payout considering the circumstances, and the jury ruled the payout was required under a maritime trade law that considered slaves to be cargo. Against this backdrop, a group of horrified English abolitionists decided on a course of action that would be condemned by today's standards. They hired a few ships and set sail for the West African coast. They intended to form a small colony and teach the natives how to build and farm as the Europeans did. The thought process was that the best way to gather support for abolition was to show that the possible slaves were the same as everyone else meaning the same capabilities, sensibilities, thoughts, emotions, etc. People being as they are and not liking anything that is different from what they're used to, it is not surprising that these abolitionists thought their method would help end the Atlantic slave trade. If you are confused as to how they intended to build this colony and hand it over to the native tribes in the area, well, the abolitionists intended to build the infrastructure and then hire and train the natives on how to use the equipment and European methods of doing things. Now this idea was not entirely new. There was a similar colony being built in Sierra Leone, which also served as inspiration for the leaders of the Bulama expedition. One of these six leaders was Captain Philip Beaver, a former naval officer. Beaver and the others held regular meetings to build support and gather funding for their expedition, in addition to establishing where they would set up a colony. Surprisingly, to me anyway, there was a slew of applicants to join the expedition. Many of them were from London's and Manchester's working class and had never even heard of Baluma or had any idea what the place was like. I'm starting to suspect escaping poverty was the main motivator rather than Beaver's and others' beliefs of commerce, civilization, and Christianity as a new African policy. In fact, many signed on as indentured servants who would work off the debt of their passage in what one historian calls a cruel irony surrounding an expedition allegedly about equality and rights. There was also no shortage of money donations either from those joining as colonists and those merely treating it as charity. There was also support from several women's groups, which is not odd given the history of suffrage groups also supporting abolition. Despite the appearance of a solid foundation, the group's zeal did not extend towards learning the local language, customs, climate, or agricultural conditions of the island they set sail for. Their supplies also lacked adequate carpentry tools and medicine. They did not have enough farmers, builders, or soldiers either. They did have one physician and one land surveyor for a group of 40 families and several single male passengers and servants. In addition, before setting sail on what they calculated to be a six-month voyage, the group drew up a charter that gave voting rights to all male settlers irrespective of land ownership, as inspired by the newly created U.S. system. Side note, the original voting system of the U.S. only gave voting rights to free men who owned land, hence the inspired by rather than copied. The expedition charter also advocated for equitable distribution of land. Beaver asserted that the primary ambition was to establish a humane colony. 
Despite all this talk, there was a distinct pecking order aboard the ships with servants and female passengers at the bottom. In fact, Beaver himself would view those people as rabble, since they were not from the upper echelons of society. Those same upper echelon passengers had the cabins, and everyone else was cramped below decks. The leaders also began divvying up larger shares of land for themselves while at sea. Yet Beaver summed up this expedition with, If we fail, they, meaning the Bolama natives at least, will be just where they were. If we succeed, it promises happiness to myriads of living and millions of unborn people. Rather lofty statements to make when already walking back part of your charter. As they set sail, the 275-person expedition would have been wise to heed the warnings of English and Portuguese sailors who cautioned that few travelers ever returned from that area of Bissau and Benin. In the 1700s, the area was still largely unmapped. Likewise, there was little information on the natives and what was available was secondhand from slavers and ominous. To add to this, the expedition actually set sail in secret after their petition to start a colony was rejected. Along the way, they suffered an outbreak of smallpox that killed several people. In addition, there was licensed scurvy. One captain sailed his ship in the opposite direction and got lost. The others decided to land in the Spanish-held Canary Islands in order to wait. By the way, relations between Spain and Britain were tense, so there was the possibility of English ships being confiscated or fired upon. With that in mind, Beaver ignored the warnings to not come ashore, and without any British government documents, they were all promptly detained by authorities who panicked over the obvious signs of disease these strangers had. Beaver eventually negotiated the release of one ship and the buying of supplies at overinflated prices, which depleted the remainder of the expedition's finances. Once the missing ship arrived, the released ship left with it. The third ship joined them that night after breaking quarantine and fleeing the harbor. The three ships were promptly separated again, but each managed to arrive at their destination over the coming weeks. The first ship to arrive met a few locals and a Portuguese Creole interpreter who warned them that a nearby island was home to the Canabacs, a tribe of the Bijago people who were very hostile to Europeans and known to practice cannibalism. When the second ship arrived, Beaver and another founding member went ashore in Bissau to ask Portuguese authorities for help sailing to the specific island. They were arrested as possible pirates. While they were eventually freed and got to the island, they were also told horror stories. The third and last ship arrived without such stories and warnings. Now, they finally arrived, and they could not have picked a worse place for a settlement. While it was symbolically at the heart of the slave trade, it was only 400 square miles, surrounded by mangrove coastal savannas. In short, it was too small for the type of agriculture and animal herding traditionally practiced in Europe and the American colonies. It was also too far from Europe to have a viable trade that was not the slave trade. In addition, all these colonists came from urban centers and were clueless as to how to set up a rural colony beyond clear-cutting forests and slash-burning grasslands for planting and building. They also did this without speaking to any of the natives they'd come to help. Without adequate food provisions remaining after their journey, they took to hunting monkeys, which brought a new challenge, yellow fever. You see, they were hunting through jungles and getting bit by mosquitoes which carried the disease. It is also unclear from one historian if there was viral transmission from eating infected monkey meat. Either way, news of the colonists' activities quickly reached the ears of the Canabacs who arrived armed and in canoes. One colonist was dispatched with a white flag of truce, a symbol that had no cultural meaning to the natives. The next morning, all the supplies, tools, and livestock that had been brought ashore were gone. A few days later, the Canabacs returned with a war party. They killed several villagers in the new fields. In a panic, the remaining colonists fled for the rowboats to go back to the ships. Most made it. Others were hacked to death on the beach. The Canabacs took the remaining women and children that were ashore with them in their canoes. 
Now, the colonists didn't immediately leave after this. They did only sleep aboard the ships, though. They found no survivors ashore the next day, only some bones which lent credence to the rumors of cannibalism. The Canabacs returned soon after and were wearing the clothing of the murdered and kidnapped colonists. While the Bulama expedition could not buy the land, they did receive most of the kidnapped colonists back. One pregnant woman and her young daughter were kept by the tribe. Soon after, most of the colonists left. About 90 remained for a few more weeks as the Canabacs continued to harass and attack them. The rainy season on the coast destroyed the beginnings of their crops, and yellow fever also began to spread. With this combination, the remainder gave up and set sail. So ended the Bulama experiment though the consequences would reach as far as they traveled as they left with yellow fever and the mosquitoes bearing it. If you want to know more about some of those consequences, you can check out the recent video on yellow fever in the U.S. in 1793. Over the next two decades, Britain would repeatedly try to colonize Boloma, but failed. The Portuguese eventually colonized the island and transferred it to the country of Bissau in the mid-1900s. Today, Bolama is known for cashew nuts, and the site of the old colony is a World Heritage Site. As for my own thoughts, this whole story sounds like the plot of a horror movie where the naive protagonists ignore all the ominous warnings and walk right into a gore fest. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave a comment or a like if you want. You can check out the other videos too, as there's always more history.